Today we are going to be following on from last week's video on how to restructure our BMS maintenance contract. If you haven't seen that video, go back and watch it because this will make a lot more sense. Now after last week's video, I hope that a lot of you have had a chance to think about this during the week and are sort of, you know, in agreement that we probably could do better and that um, not enough has changed in how we do things in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Now I just wanted to quickly reiterate from last week that periodic preventative maintenance, look, it, it keeps the BMS running. So if we stop doing maintenance on a, on a building management system at around five years, somewhere between five years and 10 years of no maintenance, the thing will fall apart and will need to be replaced. Um, or it needs, it'll, it'll appear that it needs to be replaced, not just fixed. But really, other than just keeping the thing moving year after year after year, that money that the owner is investing in the BMS, it doesn't really translate into any real value. You know, after five years of, of doing maintenance at $100,000 a year, you know, half a million dollars is spent doing maintenance, the BMS, the building will not run more efficiently. Um, you will not improve your building's energy efficiency rating. So we ha have to look at this a bit more carefully. What we have here is a, an example of a typical 12 month preventative maintenance plan. Now, every single building should have one of these. If you don't have one of these, you need to go and have a look at doing this first. So basically all we have is on the left here, it's all of our equipment. So we have um, chillers, boilers, cooling towers, tinnic condenser water, high-rise air handler units, some exhaust fans, the high-rise VAVs. We have the low-rise air handler units and more VAVs. So with a typical 12-month preventative maintenance plan, we sort of schedule out and we work out what are we going to maintain at one at which month. And that's how we know how much it's going to cost to do the maintenance. So when a service tech shows up on site in April, looks at the plan and knows they need to do service to the high-rise air hang units on the east and the west. So this is a 12-month preventative maintenance plan. So all we need to do is take this 12-month plan and restructure it and shift it across into a three-year plan. So yeah, you can see here the green blocks are you know, the typical plan preventative maintenance. And we're not doing everything in one year, we're doing everything across a three-year cycle. And in all this freed up blocks of time, where the orange and yellow blocks are, we're fitting in other high value tasks. So green is our maintenance checks, Orange is small project work, and the yellow is optimization and tuning. So a little bit of a rule of the thumb that I normally have when I do this is that pieces of equipment that when they fail, it disrupts the entire building, chillers, boilers, cooling towers. I used to tend to do them every year still. Every single year we still did them. And then quite big pieces of equipment that just affect quite a large area of a building, for example, an air handling unit. So you might lose you know, the north, facade of the building over 10 floors. So you'll lose that if AHU1 goes down. But the rest of the floor, you know, still has air conditioning. So with air handling units, I started shifting them into doing maintenance checks every second year. And then smaller pieces of equipment like, you know, fans, um, you know, package units and those sort of things, I was doing them sort of every third year. So in the example, you can see here, the um, these high-rise air handling units, I'm checking them in year one and in year three and the high-rise VAVs, I'm doing them in year one, not year two, not year three, and they get done in the third year, which is sort of one, two, three, here in the next year here. So by doing that, we are freeing up blocks of time to do high-value tasks. But in this example here, I'm actually not doing the chillers and the cooling towers every year. What I'm doing here is, so in January of year one, we're doing small project work, which is optimization. We're changing the software programs. We're doing smarter control strategies. In February, we're doing all the tuning associated to those systems. Now, 
Although we're not doing preventative maintenance here, we are actually spending a lot of time looking at the system. We're looking at how the valves are reacting and how the temperature is controlling, how the pressure is controlling. So although we're not actually in the plant room stroking valve actuators and damper actuators, we are actually carefully looking at the system. And if something isn't working, we will notice that quite easily. Year two, we are doing preventative maintenance checks, our standard sort of stuff. And then here in year three, we're not doing project work because we've already optimized this control system. We're now just doing tuning again. You know, we're checking how well, you know, how is the chiller more efficient if we, you know, increase the supply of water temperature or reduce the condenser water temperature, look at the capacity staging points, all these sort of things. So when the service tech comes to site in January in year three, he is going to go and sit down at the computer and work on an optimization or a tuning type plan. So we're not in the plant room. Uh, the same thing with the air handling units. So in year one, in May, we were going to do preventative maintenance checks. And then year two, for two months through March and April, we're doing control strategy optimization. And then in May, we're doing tuning. And then year three, we're back to preventative maintenance. So we're not trying to get rid of the, the preventative maintenance completely. We're trying to have some balance between do we have to check equipment every single year? If that damper actuator is working this year, it's probably working next year. And in next week's video, we'll run through a few more things that will really tie nicely into this and it'll, it'll sort of drive this concept home and, and prove its, its concept more. <clears throat> so at the bottom here, just as an example, I had here server upgrade. So in year three, in June and July, we are gonna upgrade the server during maintenance. Now the, the client's gonna pay for the new server hardware, of course, we can't suck that up. But you know, for those two months, you know, all the hours required to do all the engineering and all the database and draw the new graphics and, and bind the new graphics, all that engineering work is not getting charged additional cost for. So rather than that being, you know, $25,000 task, now it's just a, you know, $8,000 task, for example. And then we freed up one, two, three, four, five months, we have freed up some time to upgrade obsolete controllers. Probably not all of them, but perhaps your main controllers in your chiller plant room, and your boiler plant room, and your cooling tower plant room, like, you know, in this example, hypothetical example, perhaps those controllers are now obsolete. So in year three, we're gonna replace that hardware. The client's gonna pay for new controllers and new control panels if we need them, but all the engineering and all the commissioning that goes with that exercise is costed within maintenance. Now this is quite a simple example. It's not as easy as this in real life to actually restructure it, but you get a feeling for what I'm talking about. When I was doing this, so one of the issues I have with this is I implemented the maintenance specification on a big hospital precinct, two big hospitals, and their maintenance was around you know, $250,000 a year maintenance. I think they had a guy there full time, Monday to Friday. And they said, look, Bryce, you know, we agree with the idea of this and the concept of it is good, but we don't actually have a 12 month plan. We don't actually know exactly how much equipment we have and where it is. And it's, it's, it seems surprising, but it happens quite a lot that the BMS companies, you know, over a, a couple of BMS upgrades, you know, these buildings are like, you know, these are old buildings. You might be in your second or third actual BMS system. And over the years, stuff's gotten lost. They don't actually, they don't know exactly how much equipment they have. And in that situation to actually go and reverse engineer and create this 12 month plan, which I think they should have had anyway, it would take them hundred hours to do that. They need guys walking through plant rooms, going through mech boards, writing down all the equipment that they have, you know, looking at all the graphics, it was going to take too long. So I said to them, okay, what we could do is, so I actually reissued the maintenance specification with a second option. And option two was, let's agree that 60% of the time you'll work on traditional plan maintenance and 40% of the time you will devote to energy efficiency and optimization, high value tasks. And they agreed with that. So what happened was of their five days of the week for three days they did preventative maintenance, two days they did optimization. And then I said to them, look, that's great. I was pretty happy that we will come to a bit of an agreement there. At the end of the day, we still retain the same maintenance contract value. We're not trying to drive down the, the value of the contract. We're just reshuffling our resources and how we do this. So I said, rather than do two days a week of optimization, which is a bit ad hoc, let's take, you know, 52 weeks of two days, let's pull out those 100 hours and break them into three big blocks of 30 days, 30 days, and 30 days. 
to work on optimization projects. So we did a 30 day plan where we just went through and updated the functional descriptions, wrote all the software off site, did all the engineering, the database, download programs, and, and do the whole optimization project, which results in major energy efficiency and savings. So what I'm saying here is there's two ways to do this. The first way is you restructure your 12 month plan into a, a three year plan. If that's too difficult or impractical, um, consider just taking the days you have, the man hours you have over the year, and group taking some out and using them for optimization, which means that indirectly it's the same thing. You won't get through all the planned maintenance in the first year because you have less hours. It'll take you two or three years on a, on a rolling program to get through it all. But that's fine because we, if we don't need to check every single thing every single year. Next week, we'll go into that more, a bit more into that next week. So I, I think we'd all agree, like, that's not too difficult. Um, it's going to take you a day to sit down with the spreadsheet and the 12-month plan and shift it out. And it, it, can be, it can be one year. That one year can go to two years or three years or four years, whatever you want it to be. You can sort of work that, how, depending on how critical your project is and how good maintenance has been up until now. Um, please see below in the description, I have a link to a page on my website that gives a bit more information about the maintenance specification. Um, look, if you have the time to do this, you can actually roll this out, plus the stuff we're going to do next week. But if you want to formalize it more and actually have a specification at attached to a, a maintenance contract to just formalize the process a bit more, it helps to have a, a specification attached to that, which describes the whole process. But we're not going into that now. So guys, I hope you got a few ideas there of how you can look at your preventive maintenance plan and reshuffle it around and try and shove in some high value tasks within the maintenance project. Like usual, please like and subscribe and I will catch you guys next week.